Good afternoon, everyone. Bancroft Neuro Rehab welcomes you to our Heads Up webinar series. Today's program will focus on leisure activities for individuals with neurologic conditions. We'll have time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Now I will turn the presentation over to today's speakers, Jennifer Sabo, who is an occupational therapist at Bancroft Neuro Rehab, and Carrie Davidowitz, an occupational therapy assistant at Bancroft Neuro Rehab. Hi everyone, this is Jennifer. Carrie and I will be presenting the webinar today. We have nothing to disclose. Following this session, you will um, be able to describe how occupational therapy is linked to leisure activity, learn the benefits of leisure activities and how they contribute to quality of life and well-being, demonstrate knowledge of different types of assessments that measure leisure engagement and quality of life, explain how to use leisure activities to help achieve client-centered goals, discover how clients can structure their free time in a positive manner through leisure and how to create new opportunities for them, and finally, apply evidence-based research regarding the benefits of utilizing leisure in practice. So to start off, what does occupation mean? In occupational therapy, occupations refer to the everyday activities that people do as individuals in families, with your communities, things that occupy your time and they bring meaning and purpose to your life. Occupations can include things people need to do, want to do, and are expected to do. There's eight areas of occupation in the scope of practice of occupational therapy. The first one is activities of daily living, which is probably what most are familiar with, otherwise known as ADLs. Those are the activities that involve taking care of your own body, bathing, dressing, toileting, eating. The second area is instrumental ADLs or IADLs. Those are the activities that are a little bit more complex and they support our daily life with home and community. They usually include um, being a caretaker, being a parent, cooking, cleaning, transportation and medication management and finances as well. The third area is rest and sleep the activities related to obtaining restorative rest in order to complete the other occupations. And finally, the, four, or the fourth one is education, and that's informal or formal. That can include schoolwork or um, attending a program such as this webinar. The fifth area is work. Um, that's committed occupations that are performed with or without financial gains, and that includes employment and volunteering. Play is a sixth one. That's anything that's spontaneous or organized activity that involves enjoyment, amusement, or diversion. And seventh is leisure, what this webinar is about today. And that's non-obligatory activity that is intrinsically motivated and not related to the other occupations such as work or rest. And the eighth occupation is social participation. That's engagement in community and family activities that involve interactions with peers and friends. I often get a lot of questions that what is the difference between play and leisure? So play is typically um, would be described as more spontaneous, um, that includes joyfulness and inhibition and is done not as a means to an end, but really just for an inherent pleasure, where leisure is an activity or a task that people do during their free time. It is a use of the free time for enjoyment and enhancement in life. So that goes into our next slide, which is how do we describe leisure? Um, it's usually a quality of experience or of free time. Free time spent away from business, work, job hunting, chores, and education, as well as all the necessary activities such as our ADLs and our IADLs. Why is leisure important to occupational therapy? Um, the research shows that for occupational therapy, we um, include purposeful activities or in interventions, and it's an intrinsic motivator for our patients. Um, activities can increase our attention, our endurance, motor performance, pain tolerance, and engagement for better outcomes. So in the practice framework of the American Occupational Therapy Association, it classifies, as we said, a non-obligatory activity. So we're gonna show in this webinar how we use leisure to um, increase all of the challenges of our patients and some impairments. Um, the history of using occupations and leisure to treat patients goes back pretty far, all the way probably back to Greek and Roman physicians who they used um, a lot of occupations such as music, massage, exercise in treating um, mental illness humanely. 
unfortunately, medicine got away from that humane treatment. And especially in America, the care for the mentally ill was almost non-existent. The afflicted were usually relegated to prisons for um, homelessness or inadequate supervision by families. Um, treatment it provided really paralleled other medical treatments of the time in the 17 and 1800s, which included such acts as bloodletting and purgatives or limited supervision by families. So in the 1900s, um, OT really started to develop, especially around World War I. Um, hospitals were full of injured soldiers, not only with physical injuries, but also psychiatric and mental illness. Soldiers had to spend many, many hours, um, really in idle hours and months in the hospital. So occupying minds and bodies was very important. Uh, it was around this time that occupational aides and early occupational therapists would use activities stemmed from the art and crafts movement. So that really influenced occupational therapy um, and the arts and crafts movement was to increase leisure and productivity through hand and mind, which equaled health. There was no specific training for occupational therapists. However, the focus of the OT practice was on the holistic point of view and look beyond just medicine to find a sense of mental achievement and being productive. Um, that leads us into a quote, leisure experiences are essential to growth and development throughout the lifespan. This quote is from Albert Bandura, who is an influential social cognitive psychologist who is probably best known for his social learning theory, the concept of self-efficacy. Okay, then the next section is how can we learn the benefits of leisure activities and how they contribute to quality of life and well-being. The main reason that leisure time is important is that it gives a person the balance needed to focus on his or her other more stressful daily activities while providing relief from boredom and stress, therefore improving one's overall physical and emotional health. So how do we benefit? Individuals benefit by having a perceived sense of freedom, independence, and autonomy. By enhanced self-competence through improved sense of self-worth, self-resilience, and self-confidence. By having a better ability to socialize with others, including greater tolerance and understanding. Having a heightened creative ability, a greater ability to, be, um, to adapt and resilience. Um, leisure is also shown to lower stress and depression, specifically the stress hormone cortisol, which has been linked to positive outcomes with engagement in a lot of studies. Um, improving, improving physical health and well-being and enhanced quality of life. So there's a dynamic relationship between people, their occupations and roles, and the environments in which they live, work, and play. When disability disrupts the engagement in meaningful activity, all areas of life are at risk for impaired performance and quality of life. So occupational balance refers to having a balance between selected and required activities and stressful and restful activities. Occupational flow refers to a psychological state which occurs when one is totally involved in an activity. Elements of the flow experience include the focusing of attention on a clear goal, a loss of self-consciousness, an altered sense of time, and a sense that the activity in itself is rewarding. So quality of life, that's defined as the degree to which an individual is healthy, comfortable, and able to participate in or enjoy life events. Determined with objective factors and also with subjective perception of factors which influence human life. Participation allows individuals the ability to build social relationships, feel positive emotions, acquire additional skills and knowledge, and improve overall quality of life. So we looked at a literature review from the Public Journal of Occupational Therapy titled, Why Leisure Occupations Are a Necessary, Meaningful, and Therapeutic Use of Free Time for Individuals with Complex Neurological Disabilities. The main focus explores how leisure can provide a vital sense of identity and meaningfulness, which is linked to well-being and quality of life. Uh, the paper actually focused on more involved neurological conditions such as Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and persistent vegetative state. However, it is relatable on a whole to all acquired disabilities. So key points included occupational deprivation, which is defined as a prolonged restriction from participation in necessary or meaningful activities due to circumstances outside the individual's control. 
So this means that hobbies and activities that people choose to do for their own well-being or as part of cultural norms are being limited. And this can have a lot of negative effects. Some of those negative effects uh, might result in longer periods of sleep, higher rates of depression and suicide, lack of social acceptance and status, and prolonged social isolation. Also self-actualism, which is how freedom of choice enhances intrinsic motivation. Self-efficacy is how we equate doing with living. Spectating versus participating. So when we think of spectating, um, examples of that would be like watching TV or listening to music, um, which is not really um, physically involved. So rather than being hands-on with activities, um, which would more enhance leisure experience. So sometimes this is due to an individual's perception of physical or cognitive limitations. Competence, achievement, or accomplishment. So a sense of competence can be derived from the choice of leisure occupations to participate, which encourages positive reflection on accomplishment. And then you have prevention of boredom and stress and relationships and self-identity. Adjustment to the disability. So this is a renewed engagement in leisure that can serve as a link with a past life and help process, uh, help the process of learning to live with the quote unquote new self. Diversion refers to being able to offer a distraction and can help individuals cope with stress and negative life events they are experiencing. Goal orientation, which is the creation of an end product that gives the individual a sense of pride upon achievement. Being fully human refers to the concept that occupation is central to humankind or simply what makes us unique as individuals. Challenge and experimentation, introduces new types of leisure that were not participated in prior to disability or injury that can give the individual new identity and motivation to be active and engaged. And then lastly, cultural considerations. So it's important to consider that leisure is given meaning by rules, rituals, customs, and traditions. Gender, age, educational level, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status affect leisure engagement patterns. So now we've discussed all the benefits of leisure, what leisure is, what occupation is. We're gonna move on to describe um, the different types of assessments that measure leisure engagement and quality of life. So there's some functional outcome measures that can be used to objectively determine the baseline function of a patient at the beginning of the treatment. And then the same instrument can be used to determine progress and treatment efficacy. The first one is called functional status exam or FSC. It was designed to evaluate change in the activities of everyday life as a function of a sudden event or an illness. It was developed in 2007, and it compares current functional status to pre-injury status in the areas of physical, social, and the psychological domains. The second measure is the Community Integration Questionnaire, or CIQ. This is a 15-item questionnaire. It was to, to, developed to assess the three domains of community participation, the first one being home integration, and social integration and productivity. There's also um, standardized assessments that occupational therapists can use to look at leisure in areas of identifying leisure interests, self-satisfaction in the area of leisure, and how often one participates in leisure activities. Some of these assessments are the leisure competence measure that measures the changes in the individual's functioning over time, a leisure satisfaction scale, um, that's used by OTs and has a short and long addition. Um, there's six subscales are psychological, educational, social, relaxational, uh, physiological, and aesthetics. We can also use the activity index that looks at interests and how often the leisure activity occurs. Um, there's 24 activity items with two being work-related, 21 leisure-related, and one being other. And the final standardized assessment is the Meaningfulness of Activity Participation Assessment, or the MAPA. And that measures meaningfulness of the activities in the past few months uh, with a list of about of 28 leisure activities. Um, this is a sample of what Bancroft Neuro Rehab uses to um, mostly, well, to measure the leisure um, engagement and um, also um, if the patient prefers the same activity pre-morbidly or may want to try new activities. This, air, um, 
leisure survey is social group activities, addresses social group activities, solitary activities, physical leisure sports activities, creative activities, spectator events, and games. So when we go on to measure the quality of life, um, there's again, different standardized assessments. The World Health Organization um, developed the WHO QOL quality of life measure. It was um, trialed in many different cultural settings over several years. Um, it's been field tested in 37 different field centers. Um, it's rather long, it's a 100 question assessment and it currently exists in 29 um, language versions. It yields a multi-dimensional multi profile of scores across domains and subdomains. More recently, the World Health Organization developed a brief um, assessment and that is abbreviated to 26 items. Also disease or condition specific QOL assessments have um, been developed and those are assumed to be more sensitive to particular health conditions. Therefore, they can give more focused and more precise information than generic ones. A few examples are of a condition specific QOL measure is a TBI QOL for traumatic brain injury, the QOLAD, which is specific to Alzheimer's disease, and the SSQOL, which is stroke specific. Um, next, we're going to go into how to use leisure activities to help achieve client-centered goals. I'm gonna introduce you to several um, recent clients here at Bancroft and how we used leisure to help meet their goals and work on their challenges. The first person is JB. She is a 62-year-old female. She is a retired elementary school teacher. She loves to talk about and talk to her family on a daily basis. Um, she's a very social person. She loved baking, artwork, going to Broadway shows prior to her illness and prior to COVID. She sustained her injury on April 1st, um, 2020. She was admitted to the hospital due to a diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, she now presents with extreme fatigue, generalized weakness, cognitive impairments and fatigue, um, decreased bilateral grip strength and lack of coordination. She is receiving OT, PT and psychological services um, her strengths are her pre-morbid leisure and occupational interests. Her barriers are fatigue, motivation. Um, in the beginning, she wasn't participating consistently or attending um, consistently to her therapy sessions. That recently has improved. Um, also a barrier is her decreased mood, fatigue. She was diagnosed with PTSD following her COVID-19 diagnosis. Joan is someone who had a lot of leisure interest, but was not someone who wanted to um, really exercise very much, cardio or um, strength training. So we needed to come up with a different plan for her. Um, and we really tapped into her pre-morbid leisure interests. Um, we addressed baking and in those activities, we addressed precision, coordination, manipulation, her range of motion, strength, cognition, and memory, as well as alternating attention and direction following. What was great with Joan was she didn't realize she was doing actual work. She was actually doing exercise. She never complained once of fatigue while standing and baking for 30 minutes. Um, another leisure interest we addressed was modeling clay. We're using the polymer clay. Again, this has addressed her coordination and her precision, her manipulation, um, strengthening the intrinsic muscles of the hand, so this would be comparable to using TheraPutty, which she really had no interest in, um, and also address her cognition, following four to five step directions, how to create and bake clay model. She had to alternate her attention between her project, as well as a um, written directions and also video directions. Our second patient is TR. He is a younger patient, 28 year old male, he is currently living with his parents. He is working one day a week. That is new at the grocery store. He loves in, uh, listening to rock music, spending time with his friends. He's extremely competitive when it comes to sports and playing video games. Um, he was diagnosed with a left temporal astrocytoma. 
He is a hemiplegic on his dominant right side. He also has apraxia and expressive aphasia. Um, he has impaired bilateral coordination because of the hemiplegia. Um, decreased balance that has improved greatly though. Impaired coordination, decreased range of motion and strength, um, as well as decreased motor planning and um, comprehension of written and sometimes verbal directions. He receives OT, PT, speech, and psychotherapy. He's very, very motiv motivated to participate in therapy. Um, he demonstrates great carryover of everything we do in the clinic to home. Um, his other strength is he has an excellent support system, and he also has great insight into his strengths and his deficits. As I said, he's very, very competitive. So when we do play sports or any leisure activities, he is in it to win it. Um, we started playing ping pong with him because we really wanted to start to incorporate more bilateral coordination as well as strengthen his supination and pronation in his right hand. That was a really weak area and was limiting his ADLs and his IADLs. Um, of course, we would do traditional strength exercises and some modalities. Um, and we were making progress, but we really started to see more progress when we started to play ping pong and other Wii sports. He um, had a lot more um, spontaneous movement. Uh, he improved in his motor speed and his accuracy. So this um, activity and this leisure activity really helped improve all of those areas. Next person is MT. He is a 53-year-old male. His most important life roles, he's identified as being a father to his eight-year-old son and a husband. Um, he enjoys music, loves his morning coffee, and watching TV. Um, his TBI was a result of actually engaging in a leisure activity. He was a race car driver, and he was actually in an accident on January 26, 2018. Um, he sustained a traumatic brain injury, which was followed by a stroke, a CVA, with right hemiplegia. Um, he has continued decreased range of motion in his right upper extremity. He actually developed a frozen shoulder um, that has recently resolved. He had some pain that limited his movement. Um, impaired dynamic standing balance. He has had falls in um, the community and in his house. Impaired coordination, impaired cognition. Um, also, he did have apraxia, so he really did have impaired motor planning as well. Um, he currently receives OT and speech. Um, he is highly motivated to attend um, in OT, especially because he wants to improve his parenting role. He also wants to be able to help around the house and help his wife take care of the home. Um, Mike is very agreeable to do any activity, um, though carryover sometimes can be very limited at home. There's a lot, a lot of strategies we've put in um, place at home. But because it is a complicated home with work and a child, his carryover is um, limited. So I had a student who helped develop this webinar and she suggested Tai Chi and Zumba and I thought there's no way Mike is gonna participate in this. But as you can see from his face, he absolutely loves Tai Chi and he became quite the dancer. Um, the Tai Chi um, really addressed his dynamic balance. It really improved his motor planning um, he had to follow the therapist as well as a video, and I was really impressed with how well he followed that. Um, his coordination improved, his strength and his endurance, um, as well as his sequencing. And DG is our last client that we are going to present. Um, she's a 79-year-old female. She loves to tell stories about her past as a model, um, also how she used to love to go to dance halls. She loves to spend time with her family, dancing and listening to oldies music. She suffered a right CVA stroke and um, unfortunately has a left hemiplegia with a lot of spasticity and pain, which um, affects her occupational performance. Um, she has a hypersensitive pain actually. Um, so any kind of movement or range of motion can really elicit um, an intense pain. She has decreased balance, decreased strength and endurance also very, very anxious of falling or moving out of her space. Right now she's receiving OT and PT. Um, as I said, pain level is a barrier to participation as well as her anxiety and fear of falling. 
she has a very strong family support and that's really her strength. Also, she has got a great personality. Um, because of our interview and her constantly talking about dancing, we decided to incorporate Zumba into her treatment plan. And this really took her out of her, her fear of falling and actually the hypersensitivity and pain. You can see in the first picture, she's only using her right um, non-affected or strong hand. And that left hand is held in extension and flexion. Once we start dancing with her and getting her uh, moving to the music, she actually starts to attend better to her left hand. She starts to move it past midline into multiple ranges. Um, so, and with no complaints of pain, which was really a big deal. Um, also, the Zumba is addressing her dynamic sitting balance. You can see she's sitting unsupported on a mat. We have to put the pillows back there just in case because she still gets a little anxious. Um, it improved her endurance, her sequencing, definitely um, improved her mood as well. Um, and she loved to get everybody, whoever was in the gym, had to start dancing with her. So that was a lot of fun to see her start engaging with all the other people and the other therapists in the gym. So we're going to discuss some document documentation tips because of course we can't just write you know patients dancing in the gym so we really need to de-emphasize the treatment media so of course in this study this was or this research in order to improve a client's performance skills you can use various medias such as puzzles play cards we sports that help the client reach functional goals the focus though when documenting should be on the performance skills so an example of that would be Instead of saying the client made a cat out of play to increase independence and leisure participation, we really want to say the client worked on a tripod pinch using the clay in order to grasp objects for ADLs and IADL tasks. So we also want to show that generalization of using the pinch for leisure into doing it with ADLs and IADLs. We also have to make it clear that we're not a passive observer in the session. So we don't want to say the client compensated for decreased hand strength by using hand over hand assist to hold to the ping pong paddle. We want to say the client required skilled instruction on compensatory strategies to compensate for decreased hand strength. Example, self hand over hand assist to increase independence in ADLs and ADL activities. So also an example with TR was he's now doing hand over hand when he's doing a cooking activity or a laundry activity. So we want to just make sure that we also um, say what kind of skill was provided. You know, do we provide verbal, visual prompts? We really need to show that the therapist was involved in providing skilled care. And finally, the um, last document documentation tip is focus on the client's response to the treatment provided. Rather than saying the client participated in 30 minute Zumba activity in the outpatient gym, we want to say the client performed self-ranging exercises of the left upper extremity seated unsupported at the end of, edge of the mat during the chair Zumba activity with minimal verbal cues to achieve accurate movement patterns. Okay, the next section, we're gonna learn how to discover how clients can structure their free time in a positive manner through leisure and how to create new opportunities for them. Leisure can be used to reach an end goal of rehabilitation. However, it can also be used to reach an end goal to simply improve the quality of life, increase daily participation in activities, and bring a sense of self, self-worth and overall wellness. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, consequent quarantine and community restrictions, leisure in the home has become crucial now more than ever. The following are stay-at-home structured activities that we compiled that were very successful with the individuals we serve. This includes reading, books, which can also be on tablet or iPad format, magazines, graphic novels, comics, newspapers, online articles, audiobooks, podcasts, and education materials. The link below provides information on the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. This includes uh, really a lot of great free services. For example, pictured at the bottom of the slide is a talking book program that provides a reader device and book SD card. Additionally, BARD, which stands for Braille and Audio Reading Download, can be accessed as a downloadable application to smart devices such as a phone or tablet. And it actually looks on the tablet exactly like that device 
except it's just digital. Television includes movies and programming of many different genres, such as documentaries, game shows, news, sitcoms, sports, and exercise. So mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting, accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations used as a therapeutic technique. So there's a lot of really great videos out there that you can access for free for progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery meditation, and breathing exercises. And we use these a lot in practice and they're very successful. And a lot of um, the clients that we work with really enjoy using them independently outside of the clinic. There can also be a gratitude journal, mandala circles, and that's actually your drawing. It consists of circular designs that symbolize the idea that life is never ending and everything is connected. The mandala also represents the spiritual journey within the individual viewer. And then we have music, and that could be listening to the radio, playing CDs, an iPod, through a smartphone, computer, or television. Trivia has endless amounts of um, different genres, but one that's really popular with some of our individuals is Name That Tune. Dancing, as discussed earlier, and playing a musical instrument. So cooking could take a lot of different forms. It could be baking, um, meal preparation, um, looking into more healthy options for snacks, making smoothies. Um, a lot of times we've created home cookbooks with research that we've done online to print out different recipes. And games. Games can include board games such as chess, Monopoly, Backgammon, Scrabble, and Yahtzee, although there are many. Card games such as Poker, Uno, Memory, or Rummy. Uh, video games, which could be played on a smartphone, tablet, or the console games, which would include Nintendo, Xbox, and PlayStation, or PC gaming on the computer. And then there's a lot of activities that don't need any supplies at all. So that could be something like playing charades, having an end back activity or I spy. Outdoor lawn games at home could include bocce ball, lawn darts, horseshoes, cornhole, ladder ball, and croquet. So puzzles often thought of as just word searches or crosswords could include a lot of other different types of puzzles as well. Um, jigsaw puzzles, pictogram, Sudoku, um, hidden picture, brain teasers, which could include riddles, Tons of cognitive exercises available on this link, sporkle.com, which is absolutely free. Word in a Word, Hangman, Connect the Dots, and Mad Libs. And art also has a wide variety of options, um, which could include painting, drawing, and sculpting. They have a lot of really neat paint by numbers now for adults, um, which you can easily purchase on websites like Amazon or Etsy or other um, independent websites. Tape resist art, ceramics, woodworking, photography, origami, crafts and model building, virtual museums, which was relatively new to us, which is, is neat. You can, uh, through the computer, go room to room in a museum and, and they have even like audio recordings that describe what you're looking at, um, which is really cool. So your own at home personal tour guide and adult coloring books. Okay. Uh, sewing, so that could be needlepoint or crochet, writing, journaling, creative writing, storytelling, and poetry, um, gardening, indoor or outdoor, and really uh, what was important during COVID was communication. We really encouraged the individuals we serve to stay in contact with family and friends um, through um, technology using FaceTime, Skype, over the phone, text, um, or letter writing, um, or if the individuals had social media access or email access through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Instant Messenger. Exercise, probably the most important um, during this time um, to stay active and refrain from being sedentary at home. Um, again, dozen, dozens and dozens of variations, even on each of these individuals things discussed. There's some links here on some ones that we've used. Um, but like I said, again, for yoga, you could have seated yoga, standing, beginners, more advanced. It, it's endless what's out there. Um, tai Chi, gentle stretching, seated boxing, walking, and which is more of a walking in place video. 
Zumba and seated aerobics that you can use with or without resistive bands or weights. Okay, so how do we help a client structure their free time? So brain gym refers to functional performance activities that help coordinate and integrate the two hemispheres of the brain. So activities that would do that could maybe be crossword puzzles, trivia, memory activities, really any executive functioning task and math problems. In the picture you see here with one of our individuals, they have a personalized activity box um, and that has you know, books, adult coloring pages, color by numbers, cards, markers, uh, Legos, but really depending on the person could look different, but it's something that they know they have ownership of, they know how to access it. And when they have downtime or they don't know what to do, they can be referred back to the activity box. And at Bancroft, we actually hold an occupational therapy group. Um, during COVID, the, the focus was more on learning how to stay connected to loved ones via FaceTime or doing activities over the computer or you know what you could do with all these other um, recommendations that we had. But overall, the OT Leisure Group brings peers together to discuss barriers to engagement in leisure and whether the other and whether they're doing those activities with others or solitary activities, um, you know, being engaged. The group encourages members to research and trial different leisure activities while promoting community independence. And group members also learn about adaptations to desired leisure when addressing physical limitation concerns. The ultimate goal though, is to be able to apply the strategies that they uh, learn in group outside of group sessions to be more independent in participation of leisure. So we did review two individuals uh, that we worked with whose goal was not necessarily um, physically rehabilitation, but how do we get them more engaged um, and you know, interested in leisure. So the first individual I'm gonna talk about is EP. He's a 56 year old male. He lives in a residential group home. He is a Navy veteran who loves exercise, puzzles, drawing, going to car shows, spending time with his family and participating in holiday activities. EP um, suffered a TBI following a motor vehicle accident on September 11th, 1987. His secondary injuries resulted in right upper extremity hemiparesis, impaired balance, impaired mobility and transfers. Um, he could be very impulsive, um, which has to do with poor safety awareness. He has a history of falls, emotion regulation and impaired memory. Um, his hemiparesis to his right upper extremity requires modified techniques and repetition to increase awareness of these compensatory abilities due to his memory deficit. Um, his dynamic standing balance when engaging in functional tasks and standing and at wheelchair level, although he does primarily use a wheelchair. He's currently receiving physical, occupational, cognitive, and neuropsychology services. Um, his strengths is that he is able to sustain attention and increase engagement in preferred functional activities when he's given setup and encouragement to participate. Uh, usually anything I ask him to do, he, he will do, but if left to his own devices, he really won't initiate anything or kind of say there's nothing to do, I'm bored, things like that. But if you present him with something, he'll do it. Um, he will also forget that he has participated in an activity. So he might report that he didn't do anything, he hasn't done anything, and he might be uh, become phys um, either physically aggressive or frustrated, verbally aggressive about his physical limitations. So what we put in place that has significantly helped EP um, in the home, especially during a time where he couldn't see his family and routine was disturbed, was an activity binder that separated into sections of interest that included reading articles that he was interested in, puzzles, home exercises, and drawing. He also has a planner that he uses daily to write in his own schedule himself. Um, and then we encourage him to initiate writing in summaries of specifics about what he's done. And he also has a photo album that he uses for recall. And typically when he sees the pictures, um, if we say, hey, you remember you did this, he might not. But then if he sees the picture, then a lot of times he'd be like, oh yeah, I do remember doing that. We did X, Y, and Z. And what he does recall is accurate. So these are some of the pictures of EP. Um, as you can see, he worked on a Lamborghini model. Um, he worked on a birdhouse, which wasn't just like a glue together paint. He sanded it. He um, he used a hammer and nails. 
and we used um, a vice grip to adapt it so that he would be able to stabilize every step of the way. He did a Lego monster truck because he loved monster trucks. Um, drawing and exercise and also participates in any holiday activity that we do. He'll often say he doesn't like to do a lot of different things, but once once you encourage him, he really, he'll do anything. He really does enjoy all leisure activities. Okay, and the next person is JL. JL is a 41 year old male. He lives in a supervised residential single apartment. He volunteers at an equine therapy farm. He enjoys participating in many leisure activities. He was diagnosed at age five um, with um, recurrent brain tumors uh, requiring multiple surgeries and chemotherapy. And in April of 2019, he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma requiring a craniotomy. So secondary to onset of injuries include spastic hemiplegia, aphasia, and seizure disorder. Um, he has right dominant side weakness, impaired coordination, impaired balance, impaired cognition, decreased, decreased range of motion, and right upper extremity, elbow, and forearm, and overall decreased strength and endurance. He receives PT, OT, speech, music therapy, and neuropsychology. Um, JL is highly motivated by leisure incorporation into therapeutic interventions, and he has really good carryover of the adaptations we put in place for him um, when he needs it outside of structured sessions. Um, however, he does have a history of depression, and he easily gets um, fatigued physically as well as cognitively. Um, the modification strategies that we use um, allow him to really do anything he puts his mind to. Um, despite being a right upper extremity hemiplegic. Um, and he also utilizes access link to travel in the community so that he can go to concerts, um, go hiking, fishing, um, all those kinds of things that he likes to do. So here we can see some activities that JL participates in. The first one is a, actually a t-shirt design that he made. He loves art, he does silk screening, he draws, he paints, anything art he does. Um, you also see him doing some karaoke with his friends, going to a local arcade. So we've discussed all this leisure activity, all the structured activities that our patients engage in. But you've also heard about that we, our patients do have physical cognitive balance limitations. So it's our job as OTs to really adapt and modify um, the leisure activities that our patients would like to engage in. So we're gonna go a little bit quickly through some of these pictures. Um, a big activity many of our patients like to do is fishing. Um, and of course it provides great outdoor activity, um, a lot of physical activity besides the relaxation and the patients. Um, here you'll see there's a lot of adaptive equipment that can be used, especially if someone is only able to um, maybe utilize their um, one upper extremity, or maybe they have a weaker upper extremity. Um, some examples are an electro electric fishing reel. It has a motor and it winds in the bait. It's usually used for bigger size or fish, bigger sized fish or deep sea fishing, but can be used pretty much anywhere as an adaptive device. We also have a strong arm product. It's a hand-free device and it can decrease wrist and hand fatigue. Um, rod holders and one arm fishing aids. They can really be almost a do-it-yourself um, activity, which we have done with PVC and straps um, to help people continue with their pre-morbid leisure. We are gonna show a video. This is, of course, a little bit more complicated um, piece of equipment, and of course, therefore, more expensive. Um, um, here's some other ways um, we can adapt sports. The upper left picture is actually one of our individuals who participated in adaptive rock climbing, and she absolutely loved it. Many other ways to adapt are through um, wheelchair sports. And one other interesting um, adaptation, and we'll show you a brief video, is what's called beep ball. Those are the two basketball and the baseball um, that you see there. And this is really for people who are visually impaired or blind. So basically you have a beep ball and also the, um, the bases also have sound. So the players hit the ball based on the sound that is coming at them. Also, they are able to field the ball, again, by the beeping of the ball. Um, they don't run traditional bases. The idea is that if the batter gets to one of the bases before the ball is retrieved in the field, then they gain a run. 
Um, there's many other uh, board games, things that we can adapt, all those structured activities that we talked about earlier. Um, there's ways we can adapt all of these activities, no matter what someone's challenges or their abilities are. Um, there's actually a website. It's called enablingdevices.com. Um, and adapts a lot of popular games such as Connect Four, Hi Ho Cheerio, and even Pie Face. Um, many adaptations now to video games. Xbox actually has their own lab to trial, research, and create adaptive controllers. There's other um, adaptive controllers. If someone predominantly uses their right hand or their left hand, that's the middle picture. And a lot of even do-it-yourself ways to adapt controllers. Other structured activities we discussed were gardening, obviously raised beds, multiple stools and seats, um, and extended tools, including shovels, rakes, and hose. Um, adapted bowling is very, very common, and most bowling alleys now have this equipment. So you see a um, bowling ramp, also a grip ball. Um, we also have pusher um, ball pushers, and even wheelchairs that allow the person to be able to throw the ball on the side. Um, we'll provide a list of resources where some of this equipment can be purchased. Uh, many outdoor activities now have adaptations for people with um, who need to use a wheelchair. There's adapted surfing. Um, there's actual ramps in some county parks that will allow a wheelchair user to wheel right onto a kayak or a canoe. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the wheelchairs, um, the beach wheelchairs that actually can go right into the ocean and keep the person floating. Some of the solitary activities we talked about have very easy fixes to improve grip, um, one-handed knitting and crocheting, and also assistance with um, holding books and turning pages. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this uh, relatively quickly, um, do this at a good time, um, but how do we apply evidence-based research regarding the benefits of utilizing leisure? So we looked at a lot of research on the importance of uh, leisure activity. Um, but it mostly focused on the aging adult. So here are some examples of research that has been done. Um, you can see that just a few span from 2019 to 2016, um, but there is more research on specific leisure activities and benefits. Um, okay, so we-based movement therapy benefits for stroke patients with low and very low movement ability. The effect of Tai Chi exercise on balance function of stroke patients, meta-analysis. Uh, visual art and physical rehabilitation, so experiences of people with neurological conditions. And then my absolute favorite, uh, Lego, uh, which actually translates to play well. So the popular Danish construction toy Lego has had a widespread appeal among young and adults alike, including myself. Um, since the 1930s. So the use of Lego as a therapeutic medium has a wide range of benefits. Um, incentive to participate, fine motor coordination, creativity, sequencing, attention to visual and perceptual skills. It reduces stress, it builds on social skills, and it provides a really meaningful hobby. Um, and just lastly, an experiment carried out by the Lego Learning Institute um, suggested that collective building processes may lead to a stronger heart rate, synchronization among participants, and greater activity in the social areas of the brain. We do have a list of resources um, where you can purchase adaptive equipment, um, different ideas for do-it-yourself, also actual groups that can help with the purchase of the adaptive equipment, um, and some grants. We also have several free programs, so if anyone is interested, um, please reach out and we can share our resource list. This is only part of our list. Um, you can see there's a lot of different adapted sports, Coastline Adventures, um, Association of Blind Athletes in New Jersey. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. And if you enjoy our webinar series, I encourage you to connect with us on Facebook for more great educational content and client success stories like the ones that you saw here today. On behalf of Bancroft Neural Rehab, I'd like to thank you for attending the webinar.